Okay, welcome uh, um, to this uh, special session of this uh, conference. So um, I'm the one to blame for this <laughs> because I suggested this to the organizers and they kindly agreed to, to have this, uh, this, uh, this session. And uh, the reason why I suggested this session is uh, that uh, I uh, recently uh, became aware of uh, this uh, um, sustainable development goal, this effort that is going to take place from now to 2030, uh, 2030 and, uh, and uh, Peter McGrath is going to tell us more about this. And um, because these are very uh, ambitious goals and uh, they have a lot to do with uh, science. And uh, these are the continuation of the Millennium Development Goals that um, uh, were launched in 2000. And they were, uh, uh, what well, was uh, sort of really, uh, um, um, what is remarkable for me is that uh, to a large extent, uh, many of these goals were uh, uh, fulfilled. I mean, they were reached. And so um, uh, the, the issue is that um, maybe this 15-year effort of the Sustainable Development Goal will be a major uh, um, trend on which many of us could be uh, involved. Many of us, and the other thing is, say, maybe some of you are is already involved in some of this. And so we, uh, I think this is also an occasion to know if there are some personal experiences of some scientist who, who, who is already involved in these uh, global uh, um, uh, uh, goals. So, um, so I think uh, uh, I will just let uh, the floor to Peter. Uh, he's uh, from uh, TWAS, the uh, Third World Academy of Sciences, and um, uh, which is uh, uh, which is sitting uh, in Adriatico down, down here, and uh, and uh, so uh, he has kindly agreed uh, to. Okay, thank you. Yes. You can hear me with this microphone. Yes. Okay, very good. So, thank you, Matteo. I'm going to talk about this this thing, sustainable development. You've probably been hearing about it for a good number of years, as, as Matteo has said, and I'd like to also point out that. While Matteo is to blame for, for sort of inviting me to present here today, um, I am to blame for the presentation here, but I can also share the blame with a little bit with Max Pauli, <laughs> who is sitting here in front of me and who is also representing TWAS. Um, I wear two hats, so I work also as, just, uh, as well as for TWAS for this other organization um, that you see here, the Inter-Academy Partnership, it's also based here, and I'll explain a little more as, as we go along. So, sustainable development, what, what is it? So, a number of definitions have been sort of bandied around in the past, but what most people tend to focus on is, is this one that came out back in 1987. Um, Brundtland, I think, was the, the Prime Minister of Sweden for once upon a time, and she was commissioned to do this, this report um, our current future. And they came up in this report with a def definition of sustainable development as being development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So whatever we do today, we should not make the situation worse for you know, our children, our grandchildren, and those who will follow us. Um, so what is the situation today? It's not very sustainable. Um, one way of measuring it is uh, carbon footprint. All, essentially, nearly all our economies are based on, on fossil fuels and on carbon. And we can see that um, the US in particular and China in the last few years has caught up mass massive economies based on fossil fuels. Um, a lot of European countries also, Italy, Germany, Spain, the UK, all relatively small in dimension, but large in, in carbon pollution, if you like. Compare, for example, more or less the whole of Africa would fit inside the, the economy, if you like, of, of Japan. Um, so one of the major things that we need to do in, in the coming years is to uh, 
um, move away from our dependence on fossil fuels and into more sustainable energy programs. Um, just looking at it per capita, you see the difference. People in Ethiopia, people in Bangladesh, Nigeria, other African countries and so on, using tiny amounts of fuels for their daily lives um, compared to those in Europe, and especially those in USA. You see China per capita is much less um, because of mainly of the, the huge population that they have. Against this background, we also have a rapidly growing population. It's been growing more or less since the Middle Ages in a sort of exponential way, and it's continuing to increase. Um, we reached 7 billion people um, in 2011. We currently have another 400 million on top of that, so about 100 million a year, more or less. And we're going to reach 8 billion people by 2024. So just eight years from now, that's essentially, um, I don't know, another 100 million a year. We carry on like this. So, Of course, all these people, they need resources. They need energy. They need food. They need water. Um, they need jobs, um, everything. So how do we try and sort of ensure that everyone has a fair chance in life, everyone has the opportunities they need not only to survive, but to live sort of meaningful, productive lives. This is where 15, 16 years ago, the world's countries came together, as Matteo mentioned, they agreed on this set of Millennium Development Goals. There were eight goals. And you see the first one, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. So really a focus on getting rid of poverty, trying to wipe out poverty, because poverty really sort of has a knock-on effect on all these things, on um, infectious diseases, on maternal health and child mortality, and so on. Um, and these Millennium Development Goals, they were in place for 15 years. Nations worked on them. There was a lot of aid poured into developing countries to try and improve the situation in those places. And to a large extent, they were successful. I'm not sure they were all 100% realized, but you see the MDG2, um, enrollment in primary education, um, the amount was raised to 91%. Of course, in countries um, in the developed north of the world, we're pretty much at 100%. So it's, um, we've done pretty well in developing countries to get to 91%, and there's still a push to reach out to that last 9%. Um, in the case of um, child mortality, underage child mortality, the, uh, the rate has been cut in half since 1990, and again, a, a great impact during the, the 15 years of the millennium of the yeah, millennium Development Goals. Um, poverty itself, you see this chart from the World Bank, no matter what sort of measure you use, it's been coming down and down over the past few years, and certainly during the period of the, the Development Goals here, poverty has been decreasing. Um, but however, um, the, the MDGs had their critics, there was not really good justification for why those particular eight targets were chosen or how they were measured, what baseline should have been used. And in fact, a lot of the funding you'll see here of the, from the developed countries went into debt relief and disaster relief, natural disaster relief, as well as military aid, rather than sort of really targeting the Millennium Development Goals themselves. So it was for some of these reasons that the years leading up to 2015, there was large um, inclusive discussions. Some of you may have even contributed through your organizations or whatever, um, to come up with a, a replacement set of goals for these Millennium Development Goals. These, okay, were the Sustainable Development Goals that came about in 2015. 2015 was also notable for two other international agreements that have sort of science at their base. Uh, if anybody has an idea what they might have been. Okay. The, well, the, the SDGs I've mentioned. The two others were the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, 
It's named after Sendai in Japan, and um, it um, replaced the 10-year Hyogo framework, Hyogo, another town in Japan. For obvious reasons, Japan is very interested in reducing the, the risks of disasters and so on. Um, and again, the world's, through the uh, United Nations framework, uh, the world's countries signed up to this um, disaster risk reduction framework. That was in March last year. And then in December in Paris, we of course had the, the climate change agreement whereby the world's nations agreed to um, limit um, the sort of carbon pollution into the atmosphere in efforts to, to stop or even redress, turn, turn backwards the, the global warming. Just looking at the the impacts of disasters for a moment. Um, you'll see that the, looking at the millions killed, there are huge amounts here. If you can read it, this is the, the year where the Haiti earthquake hit. This is the year we had the Indian Ocean tsunami, 2004. And the cost of these events and, and other events, I think this is the year there was the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and then the, the Japanese tsunami here. So you'll see trillions of, of dollars worth of damage. And if you think the, the aid that goes into recovering post-disaster is aid that is taken away from all the other the goals that, that we're talking about, you see that the challenges we have and, and why these different frameworks on climate change, on natural disasters, and on the sustainable development goals are really, in some ways, interlinked. Um, science is also at the heart of many of these. I don't expect you to read this, but um, there's a lady, Victoria Murray, who heads a science and technology um, advisory group to the UN framework. And she went through the actual text of the framework, highlighting in yellow all those areas where science and technology, education and outreach in science and technology was important in the Sendai framework. And I just want to focus on this um, point G, um, which reads that the you know, country should enhance the scientific and technical work on disaster risk reduction and its mobilization through the coordination of existing networks and scientific research institutions at all levels and regions with the support of this scientific and technical advisory group. I know here at ICTP, for example, we have a Earth System Physics that works very much on, on earthquakes and other disasters and so on. Um, point G continues, strengthening the evidence base. This is science. Promote scientific research of risk patterns, causes, effects. Disseminate risk information using geospatial information technology promote and support the availability and application of science and technology in decision making. So you see, Science is embedded in this Sendai framework, um, science for decision making, and we'll, we'll come back to this, this point also. Okay, the, the second framework, the climate change, it was agreed in Paris um, the end of last year, and on Earth Day this year, it was became into sort of um, it became formally legally binding when the 50, more than 55, in fact 174 countries, signed it straight away. Climate change, so it's due largely to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but not only. And we need to start reducing the amount that we have in the atmosphere. We need to sort of get our climate back under control um, to avoid um, possible runaway greenhouse um, conditions, um, as well as the sort of the more slower paced effects that we have on the adaptability of organisms, shifting ecosystems, biodiversity changes, and, and so on. Um, just here, I'm going to try and run a small video instead of showing you this, this slide. This is just, you'll see the, the coldest years are, it doesn't like me pointing, the coldest years are in green, 
and you, you'll see them showing up in the years about 1880 um, up to 1900, 1910. And then you see it running through as we come up to the, the pre-war years. Um, a lot of these temperatures are sort of average. Okay, it stopped. They're hitting around the average mark around the 1900 to sort of 1940. Oldest years, 1910. Come into the, the uh, between the two world wars. You see, they're pretty much still cold, colder than the 20th century average. Then about 1940, the industrialization starts really kicking in on a worldwide scale, and the global average temperatures are are increasing. And then we should see the first red line coming soon. I think it's about 1990. And the, the 10 warmest years are marked in red. So here we go. Uh, 99, so, and then you see the years 2000, 2000, and to, to the current one. All the 10 warmest years, for example, are from 1999 to the present day. And actually, this year already, the, every month has been the warmest month on record. I think that sort of shows sort of more graphically than I can explain the, the situation with, with global climate change at the, at the moment. Climate change, of course, also impacts on storms and floods, and you can again see the increase sort of this is from, from 1980, sort of increasing um, effects of floods and storms. These things, they wipe out agriculture, they wipe out infrastructure, they destroy people's lives. People have to sort of rebuild everything from the beginning again. So um, you'll see that if we can mitigate against the risks of, of disasters such as these, then we can really start to focus on sort of the energies of the sustainable development goals. SDGs themselves, they were signed into action on the 25th of September um, last year, and there are 17 of them. Again, if you look at these, there is science rooted in all of them. Science in um, combating poverty, in um, developing agriculture, better methods of uh, better agro agronomical techniques, higher yielding crops, protection against pests and diseases. There's obviously science in good health and well-being in medicine, vaccines, preventative medicine, good science education, gender equality will come to clean water, energy, infrastructure, inequality, sustainable cities, Green economies, reduce, reusing waste materials, and um, responsible consumption, climate we've just mentioned, life below water, life on land, and partnerships. And I'll, I'll stress that to achieve any of these partnerships between international organizations, national organizations, the international government system, the UN system, national governments, regional governments, it's important for, for everybody to get engaged, but particularly the scientists, I think. You see they run from 2.15 to 2.30, another 15-year period. So those of you who are just sort of perhaps um, starting out with your PhD, your postdoc careers, a large part of your scientific career will overlap with trying to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. And in fact, a large part of research funding, development funding, if your area of science touches on them, then considering the sustainable development goals in your proposals and your sort of um, career, your research path, is, can also be a huge benefit to, to yourselves. And then they're also very interlinked, as you'll probably guess. So the, just an example, the goal for health is this, the green one, number three which you'll see from this, this leaflet I've scanned here, that, that health touches on, on all the others, essentially, and it goes on down and down. I just, I just picked out this as an example. Okay, so we do the science. We have great results. 
We want to ensure that these results are utilized. We want them to be taken up. We want to convince governments that, look, this can solve your situation. I have the answer to whatever problem it might be. I can purify water in the desert, or I can put a, an electric system, a renewable energy system in a remote village. You know, how do you get your research the public to the, those, the, the people that, that need it. And we like to think that we can provide scientific advice and we can affect this um, policy cycle. Um, formulation, decision making, implementation, um, monitoring and that circles around. But science isn't the only voice out there. Public opinion, you know, no politician in the world that would not take probably public opinions um, ahead of scientific advice. There's a classic case, for example, of genetically modified crops in Europe. The science shows they're safe to grow, they're safe to eat, but public opinion says we don't want them, and so there's, there's more or less zero genetically modified crops in Europe. Again, public opinion feeds into all the different parts of the, the policy cycle. We have political input, of course, your party, your political party, your political beliefs. They impact on the different parts of the system. Analysts, they'll have their say too. The private sector, oh, you don't want to go against big business and, and so on. And, and of course, there's lobbyists, there's environmental groups, there's others that all, all want to persuade governments that they have the answer. So not only the scientific input have to compete with all these other um, inputs, but the, you know, the decision-making part, the policy implementation, it's left to the governments and they, they have to really decide which bits to take and which bits to take forward. So it's, it's a bit of a nightmare, if you like. Let's um, take one example of water and how science can help and how, perhaps how science struggles to help. I'm thirsty, I'd like a drink of water. I can go to the tap, I can go to the bottle here. It's very simple. I can take a drink, it's not difficult. I want to take a pipeline of water for the have a reservoir. I want to give it a little town, a small village water so everybody has in their homes enough water to, to wash, to cook. Um, to water their vegetable patch, whatever. Um, it's complicated, but we can do it. A few engineers, a few technicians, a little bit of science, we can do that. What we're not so good at is modeling really complex systems. Okay, we have rainfall, we have mountains, we have melting ice caps, we have rivers, rivers that may pass through different countries, different regions. We have aquifers underneath. We have people that want to use the water for industry, for household use, for agriculture. Um, maybe there's people um, quite happy polluting this water with runoff from agriculture. Maybe there's people that want to fish and eat the fish there. Maybe there's people that like to go sailing and would like to keep a nice sort of pristine environment for them and their children. Um, there's a whole host of, of scientific factors, of social factors, political factors that go in just a, a single watershed. This is, this is where science is not so, not so um, good at explaining what is going on. In fact, they call these things wicked problems. This sort of cartoon illustrates what's going on, that there is a disconnect sometimes between the scientific community and the, the political community. Even back in 1973, um, just to explain this, this paper I writ on Weber, the search for the scientific bases of confronting problems of social policy is bound to fail, very pessimistic because of the nature of the problems. They are wicked problems, whereas science has developed to deal with tame problems. So tame problems are those that are simple and complicated, but not the complex, wicked problems. And this is where we, we have to sort of try and move forward and break down some of these barriers and improve our, our input into the, the political debate, if you like. OK, 
Okay, so moving on, I said I would talk about some of these organizations that are based here. We're hosted at ICTP, these three organizations. Um, and let me, let me talk first about IAP. But, well, all three organizations are really interested in um, developing science, developing science in developing countries, and really getting science to be used more and more in the, the development process. So if we invest, the idea is if we invest in science and technology at a sort of grassroots level across the board in all the countries, each country can sort of boost its own economic growth and national development, and we will um, reduce poverty, have food security for all, um, if we remove poverty, educate everybody, we'll have more equitable societies, a fairer society. IAP itself is a, a network of more than 130 academies of science. So we have, for example, the Royal Society in the UK. We have the US National Academy. We have the Chinese Academy of Sciences. But we, we have those also. We miss a few, especially in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, but pretty much a, a global network. We also work with four regional networks um, based on sort of the, each of the, the continents and regions. And we have a, a dedicated subset of these academies and medical academies involved, um, really addressing sort of global health worldwide and the sustainable development num goal number three. Academies are considered, because they have the top scientists in the country, they are credible. And they are also independent. Usually they're funded by governments, but given independence from the government so that the advice they give is not sort of along party political lines or anything like this. So, and this is the, one of the main reasons each academy in their own country is dealing with national issues and so on, but coming together as IAP, we can also deal with, with global issues, with regional issues. Um, we like to take the, the latest evidence, the latest scientific information, and sort of put that together in reports and so on, and with recommendations that we can give to, to the politicians, to the decision makers. An example of some of the ways that we do it, sort of short two or three page statements on topical issues. This one on, on hearing loss in healthcare, and it, this was released in 2015 on International Ear Care Day, so we really tried to make a um, join with the World Health Organization and make a, a sort of splash on that day. Um, synthetic biology, antimicrobial resistance, so all issues that are sort of topical at, at the forefront of some of the discussions going on in the World Health Organization and in the case of synthetic biology, there was discussions in the um, Convention on Biological Diversity. Should there be a moratorium on this, these new techniques in, in, the, in biotechnology? And you can see we had also a, a parallel paper in, in Nature sort of explaining what was in the statement and why we'd done it and so on. Um, I'm not saying that this was the main course, but I can say that the, the Convention on Bio Di Biological Diversity did not enforce a moratorium on synthetic biology, and they preferred to go ahead with sort of um, a responsible attitude to research. That is, it could be dual use as well. Um, this could be, it could be used for good, and it could be used for, for not so good purposes, if, if you like. Um, and this is also one of the, the ideas of IAP, you see, Longer, um, quite thick volumes, 200, 300 pages. In this case, we were commissioned by the UN itself to review the processes of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, they themselves produce these reports every five years. Um, the one, two reports ago, they were quite heavily criticized of their review process. So the IAC, Inter-Academy Council, it's part of the IAP now, um, did a whole review of the process. And we touch on um, how research should be carried out, um, what are the ethical issues that need to be taken, uh, and so on. So, and this is 
um, how we try and sort of strengthen the global research enterprise and get science moving in the, in the right direction together. We do, like I mentioned, our regions, ESAC in Europe, NASAC in Africa, YANAS in Latin America. These are all producing regional reports, much more topical, much more focused for different parts of the world and, and touching on food security, touching, touching on um, life below water, safe drinking water and sanitation, and all the issues that are there in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we've also uh, engaged, as I've mentioned, most of these international um, frameworks, conventions. The synthetic biology has also touched into this um, Convention on Biological and Toxin Weapons, based at the United Nations in Geneva. We have even a, a, a working group um, that sort of provides sort of expert input into the, these meetings of the, the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. And as a follow-up to our um, responsible conduct in the research enterprise, last, um, earlier this year actually we produced this book. It's a teaching guide of responsible science. So you can download this um, from the site here. You can buy hard copies also. Um, and it, it's a guide for students, for lecturers, for teachers on dual use research um, and on how to get the, the best benefits from the research that is being done and, and feed into those sustainable development goals. Okay, yeah, it's not so bad. Okay. Let's come back to TWAS then. That's TWAS uh, stands for the World Academy of Sciences. Um, again, they're focused very much on capacity building in science in the developing countries. They really want to boost the research base in those countries, get more scientists um, working, living in those countries, and working on indigenous, on national problems, national challenges. Focus. Some of their, not all of them, most of their programs are focused across the board on developing countries. Some of them are focused on a subset of 81 um, so-called science and technology lagging countries. But there are also 48 least developed countries that are a special target and a special concern. A lot of these are in Africa. 34 out of the 48 are in Africa. Many of the others are just small islands in the, in the, the Pacific and so on. Africa itself has its own challenges. It has 14% of the world's population, more than a billion people. It's going to double by 2050. So during our lifetimes, I hope, the population of Africa is going to double. The population of Africa is going to need double the food, double the water, double the jobs, Everything is going to be increased by 100% in the next 34 years. It also has a very large youth population um, that is also going to double, or more than double, by 2050. It's already locked into the system, more or less. These are a an amazing resource. Young persons are, are resourceful, they're inventive, they can be entrepreneurs. Um, but in order to do that, in order to make, uh, allow them to contribute, they're going to need teachers, teachers in universities, teachers in high schools, more scientists coming through the system to be those teachers. Um, they're going to need teachers in primary schools. You can see already at the current snapshot um, some countries have a 60 to 1 pupil to teacher ratio, others more than 40 to 1 in large parts of Africa. You can imagine what kind of education only very few kids probably will survive and sort of start flying if they're coming through this, this kind of schooling. Um, we're also through IAP, one of our, our projects is to promote this idea of inquiry-based science education, trying to improve school curricula so science isn't learned by rote. Science is learned by, by getting your hands dirty, by figuring out things for yourselves, by working in teams, 
Um, and companies more and more are saying these are the kinds of skills that they need for their employees to have in the future, problem solving, teamwork, and so on. So we think um, improved science education can help develop these talents that the businesses and big companies are, are working for. The, the current situation of PhDs in Africa, less, less than 100 um, per million population. So you can see there is a, a bottleneck, if you like, for teaching the next generation of students coming through. And we want these want these people to be teaching, we want them to be doing research, we want them to be growing the research community, but we really need to start trying to help these countries get more and more people in, into the system. Africa, I said, had 14% of the global population, but only 2.4% of research publications. So you can see that the sort of deficit, the challenge that Africa has. Um, and of course, Many of these publications are joint research and not necessarily focused directly on, on African problems, African challenges, which are needed to, to tackle the development goals. Abdus Salam, um, a quote that he says, um, he talks about the under-representation of scientists, the under-utilization of scientists in developing countries. But um, here, the goal, he says, must be to increase their numbers, the number of scientists, because a world divided between haves and have-nots of science and technology cannot endure in equilibrium. It is our duty to reduce this inequity. So this, this is why he founded ICTP. He was also responsible for founding TWAS, and it was his sort of lifelong goal to work on. He felt it was, really was his duty to redress this inequity. TWAS itself has a number of, of programs aimed at reducing these inequalities, Sustainable Goal 10, PhD training, human capital mobility, so there's another um, a broad range of exchange programs. I hope you'll take a look at their website. You can, I'm sure there's at least one of the programs here that will, will suit you. Um, research support, research grants, sort of money provided for equipment, for ex um, Disposable materials and, and so on, chemicals, everything you need for your um, research um, project, and then uh, honoring excellence, a series of prizes, and so on. So, all these programs, funding available for scientists in developing countries. I just want to touch on the, the one of the largest one is a PhD fellowships program, South South, um, some 600 fellowships available a year. And they're hosted in countries with excellent laboratories in China, in India, in Malaysia. You see um, South Africa has just come on board in Brazil, Mexico. So you can, you or your students can travel to these countries, do a PhD, and come back home and really start to, to contribute to your, to your country. Women. We have the OAST organization also here in, at ICTP, Organization of Women in Science for the Developing World. Um, a large part of what they do is also PhD fellowships for women scientists, largely from the least developing countries, but also the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and one of the problems is fewer and fewer women as we go along up the career ladder women get um, sort of less and less representative uh, representation at each step. We call it the, the leaky pipeline. So it can fewer and fewer women rising up to reach full professors, to reach decision-making um, positions, to reach head of faculty. And if you recall the sustainable development goals, there was gender equality in there and um, more equitable societies. So the OST is really trying to contribute to this do it. This is uh, one remarkable lady from Nigeria who had to defer on her um, fellowship to go to China because she got pregnant. OST allowed her to take her time. So, but just, you see, four months, the baby was born in May, and four months later in September, she was heading off to China to resume her PhD studies. Even possible, it's certainly happened before, I don't know with this particular lady, but they leave their baby with the grandmother and they go away for three years 
do their PhD, they come back and carry on their family lives. So there's some incredible stories from, from Oost. Got hundred. This is last year's data. So now they're approaching 200 graduates. They have maybe 150 people right now in different countries undertaking their PhDs. You see the, the countries. They're from all the countries in blue, but they're hosted largely in South Africa, but also China, India, um, Kenya, Brazil, and so on. So again, a south-south um, system. Had um, given fellowships to people from a, a whole range of countries, obviously trying to focus more and more on these um, countries here and the LDCs in particular. Here's one graduate um, joining with a class of Chinese fellow students on graduation day, so it's a nice positive image. Last thing I want to talk about now is this thing called science diplomacy. It's another program of TWAS. I know we all know science diplomacy. I presume we all practice it, at least at home, if not elsewhere. Um, we're familiar with international relations. I wonder, is anyone familiar with the, the term science diplomacy as, a, as two words together? No. Okay. Something. Probably that's been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Countries have been talking to each other. Countries have been sharing resources, making deals, um, science, technology, or whatever has been at the, at the basis of some of that. But it was really in 2009 with this sort of Royal Society report that the sort of the modern day definition, if you like, sort of was concretized. And it, it's a, a sort of three legged definition. Science in diplomacy, um, it's called, talk, they talk about informing foreign policy objectives with science advice. So that's almost like the, the climate change science feeding into your um, um, delegation that's at the climate change uh, negotiations in Paris, for example. Um, diplomacy for science, this is where countries come together, um, agree diplomatically, politically, to help science. The ICTP is a great example of this. It's um, set up by Italy, but with support from other nations. You can think of the, the CERN, the, uh, the synchrotrons, and so on, the square kilometer array that's being built in South Africa, Australia right now. These are all, all diplomacy for science. And then there is science for diplomacy. And this is perhaps where international relations between two countries are not as strong as they might be. Perhaps they're, they're even broken, but scientists at the more grassroots level are still working with each other, still talking to each other, still developing sort of joint collaborative programs. Um, perhaps there are still scientific visits. One example is a delegation from the AAAS in America went to Iran and came back with examples of how healthcare in Texas could be improved, for example. They came to Cuba before relations were sort of um, bumped up to the, uh, sort of, um, the, the level that they are since just the last few months. There have been frequent delegations of American scientists going to Cuba to talk about sort of I know, marine biology, oceanography, some of the sort of shared um, issues that the two countries have, but were not sort of on the high political radar at the time because of the, 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 the severe rupture in diplomatic relations that's been there for, for 50 years or so. So that's uh, where science can, can ease sort of higher level diplomatic relations. Um, topics for science diplomacy are all those transborder issues, transboundary issues, climate change knows no boundaries, pollution often goes out of one country and into the next. Um, biodiversity, including fisheries, water management, rivers often flow through different countries. Communicable diseases, we can think now of the, the Ebola rate outbreak in West Africa where countries needed to come together, coordinate responses and so on. 
um, the Zika virus outbreak. We need uh, mechanisms of sharing information, of working together collaboratively to try and find solutions. Um, there are other sort of transboundary issues as well. Wales has been hosting workshops on these issues um, even before the SDGs were put in place the last few years. Each of these four workshops has targeted a particular sustainable development goal, whether it's clean energy, um, sustainable fisheries, talking about life below water, climate change and agriculture, life on land, and sustainable water management, number six, clean water and sanitation. And of course, the SDGs are all interlinked, so you can talk about responsible consumption, zero hunger, and so on. Canadian guy, Daryl Copeland, he was speaking at one of our um, science diplomacy workshops that we, we hold in, in Trieste. Uh, a quote from him is that, despite many countries' massive expenditure on military resources, the major challenges facing the world today are climate change, emerging diseases, poverty. They can't be solved by military intervention, and science diplomacy has to be part of the answer. So getting countries, getting people, getting scientists and politicians and diplomats working together to solve the different issues that are there in the Sustainable Development Goals. I think partnerships for the goals, I hope I've demonstrated that here at ICTP, IAP, TWAS, OST, other international organizations, we are working together to try and tackle these. And I think this, for me, number 12 is a critical one, that responsible consumption and production. And if we can tackle this and address no poverty, then because of the interlinked nature of all the others, um, we'll, we'll get to a point where we're really sort of making progress over the next 15 years on all these goals. And like I said, science has an important role to play on this, and I hope that during your careers you will all contribute in one way or another.